Welcome to the Living Witness Broadcast. This is Pastor Derek Thomas, and I thank you for joining us today. Truly, the Lord has a word from on high for us, and you're here not by chance, but by divine providence, because God indeed has a word for you. Let's get right to the word. Let's pray. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for the privilege of coming together in your word. Father God, we thank you for your word being a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we pray right now that as you speak to us from your word, O God, that you speak boldly and clearly through the vessel that you've chosen for this moment. We bind the hand of the enemy and everything that's not of you. And we loose your liberty, O God, because your word says where the spirit of the Lord is, indeed there is liberty. We thank you for speaking to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text for our message today is found in John the 13th chapter, and we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17. This is what the word says. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I've done to you? Ye call me master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also are to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. As we speak to today's subject, one night in Jerusalem. I was watching recently the movie One Night in Miami. And the movie struck me because this was actually based on true events that happened between four individuals that were critical players in the civil rights movement in the 60s. Malcolm X, Cassius Clay, Jim Brown, and Sam Cooke. As I watched the movie, it, it, it resonated with me naturally because it spoke to so much history. But as I watched it further and meditated on it afterwards, I found that it ministered to me in my spirit. And the Lord began to deal with me mightily and help me understand the concept of a reboot. Now, what a reboot is, it's, it's, it's a show or, or a song or something that was done originally and then done over by someone else for a different space in time. So what the Lord began to do with me is he began to show me that there's nothing new under the sun. And with this particular passage of scripture, he showed me that the events in the movie One Night in Miami are nothing more than just a microcosm of what happened one night in Jerusalem. One night in Jerusalem, which brings us to our text, there were 12 men that sat down with the master, with Jesus, having a last meal in Jerusalem. And it's not by chance it was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem literally means the house of peace. So here God in the flesh brought his disciples, the ones that were going to bring about change in the world, into the house of peace to break bread with them, to like in the movie One Night in Miami, truly set trajectories for the lives of the disciples in such a way so that not only would their lives never be the same, but the world would never be the same as a result of their lives. And that's what God desires to do with you and I today, beloved. God desires to take each of us where we are and have a once in a lifetime encounter with us. He desires to take us and sit us down and break bread with us, not only natural bread, but more importantly, spiritual bread with us so that he can take us and mold us and make us into the men and women that he desires us to be. God truly has a work for each of us to do, including you that are, that are under the sound of my voice today. God has a work for you to do today. And our text here is to let us know that we've got to maximize our efforts and be everything that God has called us to be. Allow him to minister through us so that we can truly make lifelong and eternal changes in the lives of people. Amen. Now, we, what we want to do is we want to look at the different ways that, that, that doing this thing God's way can bring about change in our lives. And the first way it does it is it does it by, by, by teaching us how to be champions of the gospel. Amen. We're champions of the gospel because in order to be an active change agent in the world, we first and foremost have to be champions of the gospel. Now, in, in the movie, the, the, the character of Cassius Clay represents this particular person. Cassius Clay at the particular point in time in the movie was the world heavyweight champion. He had just won the world heavyweight championship, which was truly life altering and life changing in that particular time of day because no one that looked like Cassius Clay had ever won. 
the World Heavyweight Championship. And what God desires to do is take individuals that look like you and I, someone that the world has never seen before, someone that the world, the likes of which has never seen before, and seeks to do a new thing in us and through us. And what God desires to do is, is, is he desires us to change ourselves to the point where we, like Cassius Clay, can, can change our name. We want to have a name change because once we get into the relationship that God has for us and that God desires for us, there's no way that we can ever be the same. God's word says that, that, that my ways are far above your ways and, and, and my thoughts far above your thoughts. He, he said in his word that, that you're a peculiar people and, and you're a royal priesthood and you're a holy nation. And God has called us to be all those things. But we can't be all those things unless and until we realize that we're truly contenders for the faith. Like a boxer, we're contenders for the faith. We have to get out and fight every single day. We have to get out and be something more than what we are, than what this flesh will allow us to be every day. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit is a fire that burns on the inside. Like a boxer like Cassius Clay, it's a fire that burns on the inside of you. It's that burning in your heart that makes you press beyond your natural limits. God desires you and I, beloved, to press beyond our natural limits, to reach beyond the breaking point in our lives, if you will, so that we can become all that God desires us to be. And as we do that, what begins to happen is that we begin to be changed from the inside out. Our name begins to change. And what happens is that as we allow God to come in and change our name, the circumstances around us begin to change. And as the circumstances around us begin to change, we stop reflecting who we are and start reflecting who God is. And that's what happened with Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay, after this encounter in Miami, changed his name. He no longer went by Cassius Clay. He rejected the name that represented in his mind slavery. And he took on the name of Muhammad Ali. He rejected the form of things that became what it was that he felt that his God had called him to be in that, in that hour. And that's what God desires us to do today. He desires us to reject the things of the world, to reject the things of this flesh, and to be all that God has called you and I to be. Look at what it says in the word. Look at what it says in the word in, in Exodus, the 17th chapter and verse 15. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So we see that when Moses realized what God had done, he understood that he was standing underneath his banner, Jehovah Nissi. God desires to be Jehovah Nissi to you and I today, beloved. He desires to change our name. He desires for us to understand the name under which we stand. When we profess to be Christians, when we profess to be believers, we have the name of our elder brother in our name. We have the name of Jesus Christ in our name as Christians. That's why the word says it was at Antioch that they first were called Christians. And while the individuals at Antioch meant for it to be something in a joking fashion, they didn't realize that one night in Jerusalem, when those 12 disciples, some disciples came together, one night in Jerusalem, when they sat and supped with the master, one night in Jerusalem, when he gave them their marching orders, they were changed and they would never be the same. They came to realize, which is our next point, that, that this thing was no longer just a walk. This thing was no longer just a hobby or a casual obsession. This thing was a change in lifestyle, and they truly were all in. When I was a kid, my grandmother used to tell me about the difference between a chicken and a pig come breakfast time. Uh, when a chicken makes their contribution to breakfast, they're just making an offering. They're laying an egg. But when a pig makes their offering for breakfast, they're making a sacrifice because they're all in. For the chicken, it's just something that they give in the form of the egg. But for the pig, it's a sacrifice, meaning that they're willing to lay their bodies on the line. And that's what God desires us to, to, to be. That he not only wants us to be a, a, a living a, a, a champion of the gospel, but he wants us to be a, a living sacrifice for the master. And that's the Malcolm X character in, in One Night in Miami. Malcolm X understood and knew that, that something was afoot. There's something much more than the black nationalism that he had been espousing up to that point was afoot. He had 
come to realize that 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 there was something more than just being a, a black man in America. It, it, it was more than just being a black man in America. It was about being a black man in America that was reaching back to help brothers and to help sisters get to a higher and better plane of living. And in order to do that, it took more than just a casual offering of a turn of phrase here or a few dollars there or, 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 or a shout out to your mosque here or, or, or a call out to the, the uh, fruit of, of Islam there. It took a sacrifice and Malcolm X understood and knew that the sacrifice would mean that it would mean his very life. He understood and knew that he had to be all in and fully committed to the work of ministry. And that's what God is calling you and I to do today, beloved. He's calling you and I to be fully committed to the work of ministry, to be fully committed to what it is that God is calling us to do, to be fully committed to whatever your ministry gift is and whatever it is he's called you to be. If he's called you to be an intercessor, you be an intercessor as unto the Lord. If he's called you to preach the gospel, preach the gospel as unto the Lord. If he's called you to fellowship and, and witness and evangelize, do that as unto the Lord. If he's called you to help, call, help as unto the Lord. Whatever your gift or talent is, use it and exercise it as unto the Lord because because when you use it and exercise it as unto the Lord, it's understood that it's going to take everything in you. Because the Bible lets us know that at our very best, we're nothing more than what we do is nothing more than filthy rags anyway. But God is calling you and I to a higher level of understanding, a higher level of commitment, a higher level of acknowledgement, a higher level of participation in the walk of ministry so that as we live victoriously, we can live victoriously, not for ourselves, but we can live victoriously to be a blessing to others. Look at what it says here in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Oh, what a revelation that, that Paul brings forth to the church at Corinth, but more importantly, what a revelation he brings forth to us today, that we're not our own, but we've been bought with a price. But not only bought with a price, we've been bought with a price, as it says here, so that we can glorify God in our bodies and in our spirits, which belong to God. So once we say yes to God through saying yes to Jesus, we stop being our own, beloved. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. When we have that once in a lifetime encounter, that one night encounter like the encounter in Miami, we find ourselves being able to change the world, as I paraphrase, being, being able to change the world, as, as, as Malcolm said to, to, uh, um, um, to, to the men there, as, as Malcolm said to, to Sam and to Jim and to Cassius, that, that, that maybe there should be a Mount Rushmore. I, I don't know. I, I might be on the, the, the Mount Rushmore to make change. And Malcolm X said, as I paraphrase, yes, you can. Why can't you? We all can. And that's the message that God desires us to understand. One night in Jerusalem, as the disciples sat and had the Last Supper from all different walks of life, from walks of life that were looked at as being rejected and spiteful like tax collectors, to even individuals that had malintent in their hearts like Judas, God let them know your lives will never be the same. Because what you're doing here by making the conscious decision to sit and sup with me, you're offering yourself as a living sacrifice because since you bought into me and who I am, you've, you've sold and, and, and sold your soul into the work and the ministry of what it is that we're called to do. And that's what God is looking for us to be, church. He's looking for us to be fully committed, not only fully persuaded, but fully committed. And in being fully committed, what it does is it begins to change every aspect of who we are. It, it begins to help us think of ourselves not as ministers, but, but, but as martyrs, dare I say. Understanding that we're not just rendering an offering of our gifts and talents, but we're rendering ourselves as a living sacrifice to be used as God wills. Understanding that to be absent from the body is, in fact, to be present with the Lord. So the greater ministry is not whether I'm present here or present in glory. The greatest ministry is for me to to be present in mind and in spirit in the perfect will of God. And that's where God desires you and I to be. Because when we find ourselves in the perfect will of God, we find that not only are, are we champions of the gospel and living sacrifices for the master, but we become, which is our next point, voices for change. Amen. 
And God is looking for you and I to be voices for change. If you look in Isaiah, when Isaiah received his calling, he, he witnessed something in glory that was poignant in his life. And, and, and it was said by the angels on, on the altar, well, who shall we send and who go for us? Or God said, who shall we send and, 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 and who will, will go for us? And before his flesh understood it, his spirit man spoke up and said, here am I, send me. And because his spirit man spoke before his flesh understood, the angels took coals off the altar and anointed his tongue so that he would be prepared to speak a new word. Because when you're fully committed to God and when you've had that account and that encounter one night in Jerusalem, as the disciples did, when you've had that encounter in the midnight hour in your life, you have a new voice and your new voice has a new resonancy to it. Your new voice has a new vibrato to it. Your new voice has a new level of, of, of gravitas to it so that people tend to hear what you have to say. And what you have to say is so powerful and so thought provoking that it stops people dead in their tracks and makes them want to listen to more of what you have to say. That was Sam Cooke's character in the movie One Night in Miami. Sam was indicative of the realization by us as believers that, that the power of our voices and the platform that they occupy uh, 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 bring about the change. For him in the movie, that position that he occupied and that place that he held afforded him the opportunity to make the record the change is going to come. That record came right after he had that one night encounter in Miami. What becomes our song and our freedom hymn after we realize that we have had that type of encounter with Jesus Christ? That one night in Jerusalem, when the disciples had that encounter with Jesus Christ, they all got their marching orders, and many of them did what many of us do. They all ran their separate ways. They said they were going to do it. It sounded great in the studio. It sounded fantastic when we were all together. But when it was put out there in the reality of the streets and competition was there and conflict came along, Peter, who wound up having the number one spot as it pertained to the apostles, Peter himself scratched on his own record because three times he stuttered and said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. They said, we know for a fact that you were in the upper room with it. We know that you were there that night in Jerusalem. Peter got indignant and used a couple of choice words and said, I'm telling you, I don't know. Jesus himself said that night in Jerusalem that before the cock would crow three times. Peter, you would deny me three times. And that's significant. Think about it. Peter, the one who literally carried the name Petra, which means little rock. So the one that I view as the most like me, you're the one that denied me. Not once or twice, but three times. But here's the beauty of a church. Three is the number of empowerment. So when Jesus came back and, and asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter repented and responded all three times. That was undoing the three times. And God not only forgave him, but fully restored him and gave him a new platform and gave him a new voice and a new sense of urgency, which opened up the door to new power after the Holy Spirit filled him. So much so that the Bible records in the Acts of the Apostles that Peter would just walk past individuals. And as his shadow crossed over them, healing would take place. Oh, that we would have that measure and degree of power. But it only comes when we have that experience like the disciples had one night in Jerusalem. It only comes when we sell out completely to God and allow God not only to change our name and not only to change our outlook, but to change our voice. Because when our voice resonates with the power of the Holy Spirit, when our voice resonates with the fullness of the anointing, there's no one and nothing that can deny God's power. There's no devil in hell that can stand against the power of God moving through the voices of his believers. Look at what it says in Isaiah the 43rd chapter, verses 18 and 19. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The question is being asked rhetorically. I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? The answer is, of course, we shall know it because when God does something, it's glorious and marvelous in our eyes. And that's what God desires to do through you and I, beloved. He desires to do something that's marvelous in our eyes, not for our glory, because this isn't about us, but for God's glory. 
because we're here to be a blessing to God's people so that he gets the glory out of our lives and he gets the glory out of our living and he gets the glory out of our witness and he gets the glory out of our testimony. And as he gets the glory out of these things, we begin to take spiritual inventory, spiritual stock in our lives, not natural stock and inventory in our lives, but spiritual stock and inventory in our lives. And we find that, like the song said, it becomes time for us to make a change, which leads us to Jim Brown in the movie One Night in Miami. Jim Brown was representative of the change that needed to take place in the natural. Jim Brown left his role as a winning NFL player to become a face for change in Hollywood after this one night in Miami. In the word, after this one night in Jerusalem, the disciples left and were never the same. Peter, James, and John went with him to the Garden of, of Gethsemane, and they fell asleep three times when Jesus went a little bit further to pray. And Jesus prayed to the point that blood began to fall from his body because he was in such dire need. And by the time that he woke him up the third time, it was over. It was time for him to go and fulfill the destiny that he was born for. But a new measure of boldness rose in Peter, Peter got up and, and cut the, the, the guard's ear off and Jesus said, that's not the way to do it. And he put his ear back on. But in the midst of doing that, he showed Jesus something he just, that Jesus already knew. In fact, it's not even the fact that he showed it to Jesus. Jesus showed it to himself, being Peter, that there's a new measure of boldness. There's a new thing that I've called you to do. And at that point, he realized he was no longer what he once was. He, They were no longer fishermen. They were no longer tax collectors. They were no longer a ragtag group of individuals. They had a new purpose and they had a new plan that was going to put them in the crosshairs of conflict, that was going to put them in the crosshairs of, 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 of animosity. It's going to put them in the crosshairs of people not liking them and not wanting to be around them. But they had to adopt the mindset that it, it doesn't matter to me. Like, like, like Martin Luther King Jr. said in his final speech, it doesn't really matter with them now. It didn't really matter with them now because they had now seen the mountaintop. That one night in Jerusalem, they had had their mountaintop experience. They had gotten clear understanding of what their purpose and their destiny is. They had gotten their marching orders from the master. They had had their names changed. They had had their voices changed. They had had their perspective changed. So now they needed to make a change in their lives. And as the change was made in their lives, they went on in the acts of the apostles. They did so much that Luke had to write a whole nother edition, a whole nother volume of all the things that they did. And in the word, it lets us know, as I paraphrase it, that, that, that there were so many things that they were done that all the miracles that took place can't even be housed in the book. That means that God desires us to do miracles. That's why the word says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. We're the individuals that are able to carry out those signs. Individuals that have a hard time of hearing in the, national, in, in the natural are privy to something called sign language. So that through the movement and gestures of hands in certain figures and certain shapes, they can understand and know what's going on. And they can be communicated to through sign language. You can have a full conversation with an individual that's impaired of hearing through sign language. God desires you and I to use supernatural sign language to reach the minds and hearts and spirits of those that are lost, to reach the minds and hearts and spirits of those that are downcast, to reach the minds and hearts and spirits of those that are bound. But as we allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us, as we allow the Holy Spirit to change our vocation from doing just enough to get by religiously, to understanding that I have a love relationship with God that's fueled by the power of the Holy Ghost to bring about change, that's when the greater one on the inside can rise up in you and I and truly bring about natural change because the Spirit can move only through the flesh and the Spirit moves through the flesh to make a difference in the lives of others. And that's what God desires to do through you and I. He wants us to lay aside the former things. He wants us to lay aside the vocational things. He wants us to lay aside the natural things. Not that they're not important because they are. And they're important for their purpose and plan. But we have to understand that God's purpose and plan supersedes our purpose and plan. Look at what it says in Philippians 3 verses 13 through 15. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. 
And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. And I love what it says here when it says, therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind, as many as are mature. In the devotional time this morning, I addressed the whole premise of being mature. The word mature in, in, in the Greek is translated in the word as perfect. God desires to perfect you and I. He desires to make us perfect, not flawless but mature enough to understand that in the midst of our flaws, we can be a blessing. In the midst of our mess, we can carry a message. In the midst of our brokenness, we can bring forth breakthrough. God desires to use you and I mightily in the earth today, beloved. He desires to use us right here and right now. And that meeting that night in Jerusalem changed the lives of those disciples forever because they came in broken. They came in confused. They came in weary. They came in battle scarred. They came in wondering what would happen next. And they came in with all that stuff and met the master in the house of peace. And when they met the master in the house of peace, the peace that passes all understanding was transferred from him to them. And when that peace was transferred from him to them, it would keep their hearts and their minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus, so they could go forth and do the work of ministry. Jesus never said that it wouldn't be difficult. Jesus never said that it wouldn't be challenging. Jesus never said that it wouldn't cost us our very lives. But because they understood as the because they understood that it would cost them their very life. Because that they as they understood that they were fully sold out in the natural, they were fully sold out in their speech, they were fully sold out in their minds. Everything about them had changed that one night in Jerusalem. What about you today? God desires to change you this day in this place. God wants you to experience the same peace that the disciples experienced in the house of peace on that night. God wants you to have a life-changing encounter like these four men had one night in Miami. Is this your night with the king? Is this your moment with the master? Is this your season with the savior? I encourage you to listen to the word that's coming forth to you by divine providence today. To hear the message that the Lord is delivering to you through the vessel that he's chosen for this moment. And don't deny or shun God away. Don't turn him away and not allow his word to resonate in your spirit. But instead, allow, allow his word to resonate in your spirit and take root in your spirit and prompt you to action. Become a man of action, man of God. Become a woman of action, woman of God. I speak boldness and I speak activity into your spirit, man and spirit woman right now in the name of Jesus. That you would go forth and do the work that God has called you to do. That you would go forth and make a supernatural impact in the lives of others. That you would go forth and make an eternal difference in the lives of others, in the name of Jesus. And it all starts with one night in Jerusalem. It all starts with one moment in the peace that passes all understanding. It all starts with one instant with the Lord. But that starts after you have a relationship with the Lord. If you don't know the Lord today, I encourage you to pray this prayer with me right now so that you might have your one night in Jerusalem beginning now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I come before you a sinner. I come before you a wretch undone. I come before you seeking God, seeking something greater than I could ever find in myself. Lord, I've tried every recourse that I have in my natural man and I've failed. I've fallen short. I've fallen prey to sin and I need you, God. Please forgive me and have mercy upon me. Your word says that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, that I shall be saved. So I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ indeed is Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that, Father God, you raised him from the dead so that I might be saved. So I thank you right now for saving me, Lord Jesus. I thank you right now, Father God, for the provision that you've made. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life. I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me to overflowing, that I truly might be changed from the inside out. 
and used by you to win others to the kingdom. I thank you, Lord, that I'm saved. I thank you, Lord, that I'm saved. And I give your name the honor and glory forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to welcome you to the household of faith. And I want to welcome you into a love relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to welcome you to your night in Jerusalem. Welcome to the house of peace. And I encourage you to listen to every word and absorb every word that the master has for you. Because he has great things for you to do. Spend your one night in Jerusalem and let God change your life forever. God bless. Living Witness Ministries is a church on the move that's dedicated to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ through the preached and taught word, community outreach, and practical ministry designed to save souls and change lives. You can sow into the ministry via our cash app at dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. That's dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. Sow your seed in the good ground of Living Witness Ministries today. And thank you for helping us reach the world with the life-giving word. We pray that you were blessed by today's broadcast and would love to hear from you. If you have any prayer requests, praise reports, or would like to learn more about Living Witness Ministries, you can contact us by email at livingtowitness at gmail.com. That's the word living, the number two, witness at gmail.com. Or reach us by phone at area code 404-955-8846. Again, that's area code 404-955-8846. Until next time, we encourage you to continue to live your life as a living witness.